This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, good afternoon to um, to our, uh, our American friends and good evening to our European friends. And um, actually, maybe people from other continents, so most likely good good evening for them as well. Um, so it's uh, I'm Gilles Bransbo, the executive director of the ANS, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to to our speaker today, uh, Frederico Carbone. And I want to say there is no family relationship with Lucia Carbone. They, they happen to work together sometimes, but it's uh, it's totally independent. Um, Federico, Federico is ar an archaeologist and numismatist. He obtained um, a PhD in archaeological research methods and methodologies at the University of Salerno, so in southern Italy, with a thesis entitled Monetary Uses in Gortina and Faistos, Chronologies and Productive Aspect. At the same university, he also obtained a diploma of spe specialization in archaeology. He also had his bachelor in classics and a master in archaeology. In 2017, he obtained a postdoc scholarship at the Italian Archaeological School of Athens. Other research grants were awarded to him by the Data Bank District and the International Numismatic Council. Since 2014, he has been an expert on the subject at, at the Chair of Greek and Roman Numismatics at the University of Salerno. He carried out studies aimed at research activities in Belgium, Germany, Greece, England, and Spain. He is the author of studies on the coin production of the means of Paestum, Velia, and the island of Crete. Coordinates the census and reorganization project of a museum collection of the Diocesan Museum at San Mateo of Salerno. He collaborates with the Archaeological Park of Paestum and the Italian Archaeological School at Athens. He's a fellow of the first um, course of a Scuola del Patrimonio organized by the Foundation of Cultural Heritage and Activities. Since 2017, he's a researcher in numismatics at the University of Salerno. So thank you again for being our speaker today. And without further ado, um, it's all yours now. <laughs> So thank you so much again for your kind words and uh, for inviting me to join the long table program. I'm very proud of this. I'm very happy. And I'm happy to, to be with you tonight to introduce you to this fascinating Cretan context. Uh, today, I will discuss with you the coinage of Festos, is uh, one of the Crete's major, major uh, cities. Um, I have to say that Cretan coinage is not well understood yet. But recent discoveries in the context of Festos also have revealed some surprising insights into monetary economics. Um, if we consider, if we consider the coins of Crete, it's worth noting, noting that more than 30 mints were active during the Hellenistic period. The history of Crete, I'd say that this is also the history of its cities, over 100 cities on the island as also Homer says in the Iliad, often in uh, conflictual relations with each other. Only 35 of these cities, um, uh, not, uh, it's a good number, let's say, uh, are also known by coins, and we have a number of catalogs and documentation describing the articulation of this coin production. But only a few means have been studied in detail, and I mean the coins of Polyprinia and Kidonia that, studied, that have been studied by Manoli Stefanakis, those of Rapitna after the research of uh, Vasiliki Stefanaki, uh, and are also well known, and the works on uh, Knossos and Aptera are actually in progress. And today I'm happy to present you the case of the Faistos, uh, a coinage that has long been considered closely related to the one of Gortin, and I will tell you why. To go into the analysis of the analysis of these coins, I divided our conversation into three parts. The first, the description of the theological context, I think is essential to, to have the right coordinates to go. And second one on the updates gained from the new analysis on the coins. And finally, the last part on new data deduced from this analysis. Uh, so let's start by considering the archaeological context of reference, which has strongly marked the numismatic analysis in recent years. 
And I like to start with this photograph, uh, which is basically what you can see if you go to Festos today. This is the area of the palace, I can say, so which contains several different buildings. The first from around 1900 BC, which was destroyed and rebuilt twice due to earthquakes and fires. And the second structures uh, that are dated to around 1450 BC, after a long history that ended in the Roman period and remained to be discovered, the remains of Essos were discovered again in 1850. So uh, it's about 150 years ago. And the excavation promoted by the Italian Archaeological School of Athens began in 1900. So over 120 years of excavation brought to light the remains of several buildings, but mainly concentrated in this area, the area of the palace, that is known as the Minon Palace of Festos. But I have to say that what archaeologists have found is something quite different. For the history of archaeology, the archaeological research at the time that was aimed at recovering only monuments from the Minoan and Mycenaean periods, it was no trouble to remove the later structures and from the archaic, Hellenistic, and Roman periods in order to just shed light on earlier deepings. In the archives of uh, the excavation, for example, it's not unusual to find photographs of Hellenistic structures that no longer exist, or even materials from the Greek and Roman periods that attest to the more recent facet, faces of the city, as in the case of amphora stamps and temple remains that are from the Hellenistic periods. And among the various materials that were documented in the past, uh, but whose trace was, was then lost because they were systematically discarded as being of little interest with respect to the purpose of the excavations, we also find coins and pottery from the Hellenistic period. These include coins, which we know also from the noted books of archaeologists working on site, to have been found in Festos, but of which we have lost all traces. These were donated to a museum or used as trading goods for the creation of museum collections. Until recently, that, uh, what was understood was the city, is, city's history came as a result of excavation that, by their very focus of approach, have left out information about more recent phases. I show you this plan of the city, which until a few years ago described the area of the palace highlighting mainly the Minoan faces that you can see in dark and, and light blue, uh, while historical faces have been reconstructed in purple, and only a few pieces of evidence in yellow and orange mark the buildings of the Hellenistic and Roman periods. But I must say the reality around this area was quite different. So already looking at at the rest of the landscape, which can be seen right from the palace uh, area, two main ele elements stand out. First of all, a vast valley below the hill. This is the Messara Plain, a fruitful land that for millennia has been subject of contention between the various cities of central and southern Crete, and in particular, Gortin and Festos. Then behind it, behind the palace, a higher hill whose shape still follows a non-natural tracing, hiding something that is more important. And it's precisely from this and the desire to understand more about the, the, this uh, ancient city that uh, the settlement and the economic dynamics of the city of Festos, the excavation Sari project of the uh, University of Salerno and the group of archeologists which I belong came about. And that's why we started exploring the surroundings of the palace, looking towards the landscape around it. In this way, it was possible to reconstruct the circuit of the walls from the Hellenistic period, identifying in that small hill behind the palace what appears to us to be the very acropolis of the Greek city. An acropolis with its monuments and inscriptions which mentions names of magistrates at least until the middle of the second century BC. A bigger city than previously expected with its own acropolis, a large settlement area in the valley, public spaces, and also different necropolis. 
So what we have identified then is the space of a city from the archaic to Hellenistic periods before the city was destroyed in around 150 BC by the nearby city, city of Gorky. But our work does not end here because if we have found the Acropolis and we know the extension of the city, you can see that uh, below the Acropolis, under all these crumbling stones, what remains of the houses and squares. You, so you can imagine how much information is still to be recovered in the future. So having seen, even if only quickly, let's say a framework of the archaeological context, we can now move on analysis of the coinage of Pestos, summarizing what we have known about uh, it so far and what we can add right now. As for, the, for any coins from Crete, it is still necessary today to refer to the work of Ioannis Svoronos, a, a Greek archaeologist and numismatist, who was the first in, in uh, 1890, after participating in a project that was promoted by the French Academy, to create a recent catalog by the, by the issues of all the cities of the island. For each city, Svoronos created information on its, on its history, geography, and mythology, adding to the descriptions with a list of coins, sorting them by metals, nominals, and describing all the specimens he had survived by studying collection where these coins were dispersed. So to Svoronos, we also owe the first chronological sorting based mainly on the analysis of, of style and epigraphic evidence. So even today is still a fundamental work as uh, it represents the only general synthesis and the starting point for more in-depth analysis. So important still in 1970, Oliver Picard decided to publish it again with a new edition. And I have to say that also another pioneering work is that of Georges Derrida, to whom we also owe the analysis of the coinage in the 1960s based on the study of three features of Cretan coinage. So first, Derrida proposed the analysis of hordes to understand aspects of hoarding and chronological relationships between the issues of various cities. And in addition, it was the first to understand the importance of overstriking in the Cretan context. So he noted that many Cretan coins, and in particular silver starters, were overstriked. An interesting fact for establishing relations between Crete and other economic areas of the Mediterranean, but also for proving useful elements for the creation of a relative chronology. Finally, also the study of countermarks. So Lerder first noticed that many silver coins were countermarked with symbols that were related to other local means and that some of these also had legends. He used this data to investigate the characteristic of circulation in the various areas of the island and to understand the levels of autonomy of certain cities. While those of Svoronos and Lerida so they remain the milestones of the in the analysis of Cretan coinage, it must be said that in recent years, there has been a renewed interest in such research. In the last decade, many papers have been published on the coinage of various cities and on the relations between Crete and other economic areas, such as the Peloponnese, Egypt, Asia Minor, and more recently studies on individual means that are also being published. So all in all, uh, this is the current situation, but now I'm reproposing this map to address the coinage of Prestos in detail. It's no coincidence that I joined it with uh, the nearby Gortin. Gortin is a much larger city with a more recent but no less important history, so much so that it became after uh, centuries the capital of the, of the province of Crete and Cyrenaica during the Roman Imperial Age. And indeed, the history of Pestos and Gortin is closely linked, and coins also seem to have played a role which we can now describe in more detail. In the past, the borders of Cretan cities have also been marked, and it is no coincidence that Fessos and Gortin, which according to Strabo are only 60 stadia apart, seems to touch their spheres of influence. An evidence of a common heritage also comes to us from some pottery records, such as a fragment jointly bearing the names of two cities founding heroes, Heracles and Gortis probably celebrated in a common sanctuary 
built by Gortin and Fessos together. But the proximity of the two cities is given precisely by the coins. So if you notice the types of the coins below, both have the same type of Europa, a Cretan princess, the Cretan princess, on a bull on the obverse and a lion's head on the reverse. What is different is only the legend, which is Faistion Topaima for those of Festos and Gortinos Topaima for those of Gortin. A legend that has the same origin, according to scholars, it was necessary to distinguish the productions of the two cities, perhaps coordinated in a sort of a agreement as in Politeia, or to degree a kind of pride in start of their own coin production. Or, on the other hand, they were made in the same workshop and it was therefore necessary to distinguish them for use in different cities. However, one is the coin of the city with the legend, I am the sign of Gortin, of the city of Gortin, and the other is that of a community, I am the sign of the Festi, of the people of Festos. But in order to clarify the articulation of these coins, as well as the economic and monetary relations that the city of Festos had in antiquity, it's necessary to first investigate this production. To do this is uh, essential to start with the evidence and to sort out the information we have. It's important to analyze which coins have been found in archaeological context, which can give us information, chronology, circulation, system of use. Uh, which can, uh, uh, yes, in, but also hoards in order to establish new elements for chronological links. Forms of hoarding and circulation, especially in periods where the hoarding of large quantities of coins seems to be concentrated, as in the first half of the first century BC. Archaeological information can also provide us with data on the phases of the city's life and its productive administrative and territorial organization. These can also be confirmed by epigraphic documentation, which is useful for, useful for grasping the institutional aspects and uh, the government structures. So the starting point is to reset our knowledge and after, uh, so what was uh, the idea given by Svaronos based on the is is necessary to go on basing on the evidence of a new analysis of the material to create a new corpus as complete as possible, leaving the coins to give us more precise indications. This is not an easy task given the difficulty that we will see, but it's possible. And the construction of a new corpus of coins for the whole mean goes through the study of several categories. First of all, coins from archeological excavations, then those from hordes, the coins in public and private collection, and finally, a very important topic, auction and fixed price lists. The first data we can analyze is that relating to coins from archeological context. Unfortunately, this data is not entirely indicative, precisely because of the history of archeological research at site. So we've seen that even if coins have been found in past decades, and this photograph, photos date back to the 1950s, in fact, no trace of them is left. Uh, it's precisely these coins that were donated to museum without any record for, uh, of their provenance. And we don't know if they were from a hoard, from individual finds, if they were associated with other materials. So it's totally a lost record. It is impossible to recover right now. But if today we look at, uh, this is a very funny, uh, situation that I always uh, talk about. So if today we look uh, at what is left of the coins from excavation, there is also one small wooden box in one of the several storerooms containing the finds recovered more than a hundred years of research. A total of seven coins, all in bronze, on which only one coin, actually in a matchbox, is a bronze from the mint of Festos. All in all, we can say that only one bronze coin of the local mean is preserved from the archaeological excavation in the area of the ancient city of Festos. And in addition, we have no indication on its archaeological context, since in the note written in Italian by the discoverers, uh, this coin was found in April 1991 in a sporadic find from the palace, Minion Palace area. So it might sound, sound crazy, but we only have one bronze coin 
that is ironically from the area of the Minoan Palace. Uh, information from coins, archaeological context is very limited, but unfortunately, we can draw on other sources. And it's no coincidence that museum collections are rich in Cretan coins, including those from Pestos. These are generally silver coins, sometimes uh, even from small hordes that were dismembered and dispersed in Europe and United States. Thus, the reconstruction of a large sample involves a survey of these coins, museum by museum a simple operation for large collections, especially if they are available online, but requiring extensive work to relocate specimens that are stored in marginal or little known collection. These were often formed by donation or acquisition often from the market. So the subject of hordes is also a useful one. Uh, suffice to say that the coins of Pestos are known from at least eight hordes, which not only preserve a total of 85 specimens, but also give us information about their circulation, their dating in relation to the issues of outer Cretan means, and the periods of greatest hoarding need on the island. It's no coincidence that almost all of them date from the first half of the first century BC. It's also no coincidence again that small hordes of foreign coins have been found in the area of the city, dating from the middle of the second century BC, just as the city was being destroyed by external powers. Finally, also the market represents a particular context to be analyzed. So already since the end of the 19th century, with the dissolution of large collections, Cretan coins have been constantly on the market, and therefore both auction catalogs and dealers' sales lists contain information on many Cretan specimens and to also from the mint of Festos that are periodically offered for sale. For this, for this reason, it was essential to make a detailed census of all the specimens that have been offered for sale over the years. The work was carried out in several libraries that hold sales catalog both in Italy, at uh, museums of Naples, in Rome, in Milan, in Greece, at Numismatic Museum of Athens, in Vienna, at the Department of Numismatics and the Monetary History of the local university, at the Royal Library of Belgium, but above all, at the private library of a collector and bibliophile, that is Basile Demetriadi, who has his own library of action catalogs in, in Athens. Uh, it, it was in the latter library that uh, the bulk of the work was carried out with a census that took four months to browse all the, um, the catalogs, several thousand of catalogs. And was, this was essential to trace around 1,300 catalogs, uh, listings, uh, 823 specimens belonging to Festos. These are often coins that appeared in the one catalog and then uh, subsequent others because they were unsold or because even decades later they, later, they changed the owners. But indeed, this work has been optimized to recover data from other means that will be studied in the future, like for the case of Gorky, and uh, which are also among, this is also among the most important credit colleges. And this work has been essential and has revealed a strong and continuing interest among collectors in credit coins. Indeed, the, the coins of uh, Festos appear in large numbers in sales for a whole range of reasons of interest to collectors. They have greater special features related to historical narrative of the island's phenomena, uh, are quite rare and very iconographic themes, uh, themes that are related to local mythology, mythological events. They can be divided into different groups, uh, each uh, with uh, particular features, as in the case of the earliest issues, which shows the types of the princess Europa on the bull, a clear reference to the myth of Europa and rape of Zeus, one of the most significant events in Greek mythology that is set in Crete itself. That's why, according to the legend, Zeus fell in love with Europa and approached her while she was with her servants, and he took the form of a white bull, and themselves, seeing him calm, took to caressing him, even Europa climbing on his back. Then the bull began a long, uh, began a long ride, and after hours and hours of working, arrived at the island of Crete, where he revealed himself in Zeus. 
then Zeus declared his love to Europa, and from the, this pair was uh, were born Minos, which is the mythological founder of Knossos, Sarpedon, and Radamantus. Radamantum, Radamantus himself, son of Zeus and Europa, is, according to some uh, traditions, the founder of Christos. Other coins showed the myth of Heracles, always depicted as a birdless young. Is depicted in the act of doing his work, such as harvesting the golden apple from the garden of Hesperides, uh, fighting with the Hydra of Lerna, tying up the Cretan bull with its bones and muzzle, or sealing the Gideon scattering. In other coins, it's represented again in association with the bull, which is perhaps what refers to Zeus and not to Heracles, while the latter is resting with uh, his weapons hanging from a column, sitting on a rock or an amphora. Finally, just from the coins, we also know additional aspects of the Cretan mythological tradition. This is, for example, about the coins that are test, they attest the god Vulcanus, which for some would be an attribute of Zeus celebrated in Crete, or the autot automaton Talos and the dog Lelapus. These two, along with a javelin at never missing target, were the gift of Zeus offered to Europa. The giant automaton Talos had the task of guarding the island defending from the enemies who tried to land there. And for this, he made the rounds of the island every day, ready to hurl red hot stones at invaders or burn them by embracing after getting red hot in the fire. While Lelapus was a dog with an unerring sense of smell who never missed his prey. Just the type of Talos is used first for silver starters and then for bronzes when this will be the only coins to be produced, a sign of a shift in types that used to identify the most valuable coins in production at the moment. So this mass of coins is attested in auction sales that not always have photographs, the provenance records and physical data, I mean weight and dimension at least, uh, if anything also diaxis. So it was necessary to create a simple system for comparing this mass of data and where possible to also adding their photos. To identify the duplicates that were surveyed from more than one sale, but indeed also to keep order among this mass of data that is still growing, which is far from easy to manage. This work was absolutely time consuming and quite complicated, but it's also made possible to recover other data that were not primary at the primary, primary focus of the research. Just to give you an example, uh, tracing the path of each coin, something that even detecting their provenance from cords. As in the case of the study I show you uh, here, one of those of the is issues with Talos on Obverse and the Bull on the Reverse that I saw I showed you before which came from a horn discovered in Festos in 1956, and then began its journey around the world, passing from hand to hand first in Athens, then in the hands of the collector Charles Gillet. Upon its death, it must have been in the hands of a new collector until the next sale in Chicago and then in New York. So it was possible, this was possible for each coin, not so much to reconstruct the road, but to be able to fix the origin of certain groups of coins that moved simultaneously in related trade circuits. This is the framework of the global scale dispersion coins, for example, which can be then analyzed in detail for each year. And for example, until 1970s, the, the preferred trade channel was Switzerland, France, and United Kingdom, while in recent decades, the market has been concentrated mainly in Germany and United States. So we can also give a look to how lots of coins were moving. So if we see the sales, for example, of silver and bronze coins over time, it's also possible to determine the trend of this stellar dispersion by identifying some anomalies that are quite significant. The silver coinage has peaks that corresponds and they reflect also, this is reflected also in documentation that was described by George Lavidel um, to the dispersion of at least two hordes while at least three others that are smaller and characterized by sudden sales of starters of the same pairs of dice are attested. And moreover, one can, also, one can well see the explosion of the electronic marketplace with the broadening of the Asian audience and the interest parties even to pieces of lesser value, which has led to the sale of hobbles. Previously, 
the obols were completely unknown for the mint of Pestos. They are just appeared with the electron marker and large number of bronze spills that tested only sporadically. And it's funny to see what the impact of the economic crisis in the past decade was when the sale of more valuable specimens collapsed since 2009, overcome by those of less valuable bronze value. Now, having completed the description of what we know about, uh, uh, now know about specimens from Pestos, you can see how collecting a sufficient sufficiently representative sample led to the abolition of new data. So first of all, we can see that the new corpus following the first one that was organized by Svoronos now includes 1,004 coins from museum, public and private collection, market sales, and hoards. These coins can be organized into 22 homogeneous groups, which in turn can be divided into subsets up to an overall total of 101 series. Um, the problem remains, however, how to organize the articulation sequentially to, to give an order and some chronological indications. So what can be done is to reconstruct the articulation through the study of sequence of dye, so the dyeing studies. Since the sample is representative enough to allow this kind of analysis, it's easy to see that by analyzing the dyes used to produce the coinage, it's also possible to establish which dye was produced earlier and which later, especially since there are several times um, the, when the, the exchange is quite, is quite frequent. And this makes it possible to reconstruct an initial sequence to bring some order to, to this mass of coins. And in addition, we can see that there are periods of very regular minting and other periods of very high production, a sign that a lot of money was needed and then that the minting of coins was rushed with the exchange of numbers, numbers uh, dies prepared to mint many coins, mostly starters and therefore the highest value in use. But in some phases, the coinage is very basic. I would say simple linear because individual dies work in a linear pattern but then this is quite different for the periods of greatest activity as the same is repeated in the final moment of the production of the last coins, which are the bronze ones. So at this point, once a sort of relative sequence has been established, it's necessary to insert hook points for more punctual chronologies that can complement the identification of the production organization of issues. The data considered are basically free. The weight standard, the epigraphic attestation, and analysis of overstruck coins widely attested in Crete and therefore also in Festos, as George Lede has already indicated to us. So let us look at the weight data focusing on silver coinage. We know how uh, we know now know, uh, that not only standards, but also drachmas, triobols, and doubles are minted in Festos. And the starters always have a weight lower than what should be the reference weight standard. I mean, the HNH one of 12.20 or no more than 12.40 grams. While this is less evident for the other small values, which are often not surprisingly overstruck on edging coins. The datum is very, is even more significant if we look at the starters alone. So, it's no coincidence that if we look at the points of fundal densification, which are more significant opinion than those on the average weight of the coins, a new finding emerged that is particularly significant for the understanding, understanding the economic dynamics of the city uh, and the island. We have seen that the coins uh, weigh less than those of Regina, and in fact, they seem to confirm the existence of a weight of 11.80 grams for early Cretan coins and to the existence of a different weight that is locally in use within the island. Then this has reductions first to 11.60 grams, and then shortly before the destruction of the city to 11.20 grams. Two factors are evident. The first is that coins are subject to reduction and to those with lower weights fall of the others. And then weight reduction occurs at time of severe economic crisis when there is a need to produce more coins. And it's no coincidence that the first reduction could be placed in the years of the Litos War, a big conflict that was involving the whole island around 
221 or 220 BC. And that the second reduction is placed around 160, 150 BC. That is at stage when the city was experiencing its last stages of life before the destruction that was uh, caused by the nearby Gorkin. Other chronological pointing is provided to us by epigraphic records. And fortunately for us, the Cretan were in habit to writing extensively, prefer preferably on stones, at least for public documents. So we have several descriptions carrying information that is closely related to the use, production, and circulation of coins. And I present, just to give you an example, two cases. The first is this, uh, the one on the left, relates to the imposition of payment of fines to, to be made using starters. And documents is the only decree used jointly by Gorky and Festos, united around the third quarter of the first century BC, by a kind of political agreement, a simple idea, we can say, and it provides for a fine for magistrates who do not establish just agreements. And the second one on the right, it relates to the imposition on uh, Gortin concerning the acceptance of bronze coins instead of silver robots. It's dated to the second half of the first century BC and give us insight into how bronze coinage had already been introduced, but that this found problems in being accepted as trust currency. The, this is a degree of Gortin, but this is uh, valid for all Creek. And finally, the overstriking. These two are essential to pointing out the chronology of our five source coins. It's sufficient to think that about 30% of all coins are overstriked, of what we see, of course, so there they are surely more. And that in many cases, we see signs of this processing only because the plants were not well heated before receiving the new striking or because it was needed with little care. We might therefore speculate that overstriking was uh, even more widespread and that this was necessary because there was uh, an absence, a lack of silver to be transformed into new currency. But in any case, an analysis, analysis of the other types where the details of the earlier types are not legible make it possible to identify chronological terms before which a coin cannot be placed. And to be overstruck are mainly coins from other Cretan cities, but also from Aegina and Cyrenaica, but also from Boeotia, the Peloponnese, and Cicadic Islands. A different datum from that of the Nerbi Gortin, for example, where the overstruck coins are mostly those of Cyrenaica and rarely, very rarely, rarely coins of Aegina. Finally, other chronological indications are given to us from the reading of the material. Examples of these are the coins produced with broken dice, which indicate how the impetus of production was high and that the coinage continued to be struck even with uh, well-worn dice. In the meantime, that others were produced as replacement, as in the case of the coins at the top. Totally different is the case with the coins at the bottom from the group R. Uh, these are specimens produced with a coinage that uh, begins it, uh, with a die that begins its production, but after a short time, it's perhaps set aside so that it first shows signs of rust and then brush marks. This will later be replaced with a die representing a totally different style and with a different epigraphic rendering. So this is perhaps the result of another engraver different from the previous one. And yet another data is uh, that of retouched dies. There are dies such as the, the one of rivers uh, that in this case used to produce coins that uh, you see here, that at some point are reworked because they are particularly worn. The retouching involves the re-engraving of the legend, which now changes totally, both the epigraphic characters and all the direction. First, the legend is Feisticon, and then after it's just Feist. And the new letters are shows, shown with a more modern alphabetical rendering and a different direction. Two signs, that would attest to the presence of different engravers active in the later close time frame. And however, it's evident that they refer to a different writing background, perhaps caused by a, of a generational gap. So in the end, if we take again the relative sequence that we saw before related to identification of what comes first and what is next, we can now introduce new hooks. 
These are the data sort of fixed points given by overstriking production patterns, weight deviation standards, and epigraphic information. This is certainly makes it possible to have not an absolute, an absolute chronology, but a, a relative one with some firm links on which to then develop, develop future comparison with other Cretan coinage as well. And now we can conclude it with some final considerations. And I like to start to reason starting from um, this coin again. The only one from Festos surviving after 120 years of excavation in archaeological area of the city. So I imagine what would we say if we only had this coin? So we just can, we just refer to coins from uh, excavations. Of course, that the coinage of Festos is completely dimensional. This is that it consists only of bronze coins. Uh, they are very rare specimens because they were clearly produced in a very small number and probably for our local circulation without any prospect of being a regional scale currency. Maybe uh, the result of a city that is not very active in monetary practices. On the other hand, it's clear how the reconstruction of a large representative sample, first of all, allows us to understand the complexity of this coinage, which goes far beyond what we have previously expected and hand in hand with new archaeological discoveries also. These at the moment represent only one brick in reconstructing the larger monetary context of the island, which is made up of local fissures that need to be supplemented with a comparison of coin production of other cities. And I imagine how much we might know by integrating this data with those of the Nervi Gorfin, but also the information we will have about Knossos and other main cities. In addition, we can imagine from the amount of our overstriking how important the flow of foreign currency was on the island and how the Cretans organized themselves to keep this greater great value from spilling out of their borders. A functional solution in addition to weight data to contain silver within the island given the absence of mines also. This discouraged outflow as the use of lighter silver coins mean that the use of local currency was not convenient, convenient outside the island. And we are used to think about the Ptolemaic Egypt created a close to the economic system to overcome the lack of silver, but it seems clear now that also in Crete this was um, um, a kind of exper experiment uh, even earlier and with good success given the total absence of Cretan currency outside the island. And finally, the Cretan context gives us insight into the system of use of coins, both local and foreign, uh, which are sometimes found circulating together and sometimes creating sub regionally monetary context. So in conclusion, I would like to say that the Cretan monetary reality is much more complex, like the, the case of Fessos is uh, showing than previously supposed. This is clear from the publication I showed you earlier and from the analysis of the material that can be carried out with studies of individual means. So this is one brick, I say, by, but in, uh, in the next uh, future uh, individual means studies will be clearly fundamental that uh, by coin by coin, reconstructing data that the history of archaeology has previously described. And I thank you very much for uh, tolerating my bad English and to, to, to for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stop screen share. Do we have any questions? You guys can either unmute yourself, put in the chat. Oh wait, let's see, there's something in the chat. When you gathered coins for the, I'm sorry, not sure how you were pronouncing that, the study. <laughs> Did you also gather coins from other Cretan cities at the same time? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely, because it was necessary to do it. In, uh, uh, I started with uh, Festos, of course, but also to go with Gorkin, because uh, when I started my PhD, uh, I started to study the two means together, uh, as it was used um, used to do before, no? because they were strongly linked together. But I understood that it was impossible because the, the material was too much to be studied. And then I focused on Festos, but I also uh, take the all the information for a corpus on Gortin, and uh, I hope to publish with the Archaeological School of Athens in the 
I hope next year, but it depends on the commitment at the time of university every day. So it's quite different. But for example, uh, for Festos, I get read information about 1,000 coins, but of about Gorton, there are 4,000 coins. So it's a much bigger mass of materials. And also, I get information about coins of Axos and Lithos, which I hope to, to give to other scholars to, to study them. Thank you. Peter? Uh, Federico, fantastic talk. Um, congratulations on this developing study. It looks uh, very good. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions. Um, one of which has to do with your um, designation of groups and series, um, and I forgot what the third was. Um, and I, I, I bring this up in light of uh, Francois de Caletay's Revue Numismatique article a few years ago, where he discusses all the problems that we have with the terminology of groups and series and and so forth. Um, what What is your distinction between the groups and the series? And I forgot what your third um, category was. Um, that, that's the first question. And the second question I have, do you, do you have any um, sense of how how much of a time frame was involved in the drop of the weights over time? You know, are, are we talking about, um, uh, say, 50 years or a shorter period of time when the weights dropped um, from 11.8 to, I think it was 11.4 and then 11.2 or thereabouts? But that... It's also a rather interesting phenomenon. So thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Very nice to see you. Yeah, you and, too. Uh, I, I I know very well the, the paper of François de Caladay because it was a it was a a problem for me to go through it because uh, he put me many 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 doubts so how to manage this mass of materials. So uh, the organization that I made was um, there is a terminological problem. Uh, of course, because uh, we, we use the same words to say different things. So what I used to, to do is to move with the um, lexicon that you, we usually use uh, in the Italian numismatic context. And we made that the, uh, the uh, first division groups, so groups that are homogeneous by types and legends, and then by issues. Uh, so uh, every issue is uh, every change in type and legend within this group. And I didn't list any variation inside the issues because the variation are very, very large, very, um, there's a large number because there are a lot of variation given to the rendering of uh, engravers. So it's very easy to see that different engravers are working at the same time, so everyone has got a different style, a different way to, to write the legend. So also the rendering of letters is, uh, is dependent. So this is the, the scheme that I adopted. So to make it simple, because it's very hard to, to distinguish. And in the case of Fresos, it was possible because the, the, we have just, I would say 1,000 coins, but it will be a problem when I will do the same corpus for Gorting, for example, where with 4,000 coins, with bronze coinage, I will need, of course, also a bigger a level of detail. I'm quite, quite sure about this. So in this case, I think that I will also add another category, which are the variants inside the issues. And about the, the drop of the weight, uh, this is a, quite a problem because uh, I have this two different phenomena. Uh, the first reduction uh, is after um, a kind of quite long stop in the coinage movement. So it's about after maybe half century of the stop, and then they start again to produce money with a zero, 0 0.20 grams left. And the second case, the second drop that I've been weight uh, is very clear that it appears, it happens in during the, the, the production because the same dies that they product they they are used to product to produce money with the 11.60 grams they drop to another standard so this is very strange and that's why I think it's uh, related to any very significant events that affect the city. Very good, thank you. Thank you so much. There's another question in the chat. 
as the weight decreased, was there a change in the alloy? I have to say that we don't have any metal analysis yet. Uh, it's very hard to, to get uh, because the materials they are stored in museum collection, private collections, and uh, it's very hard to, to go on this point. But uh, this is a question that we, we had, uh, and we discussed this with also with uh, Vasiliki Stefanaki, who she works at the Numismatic Museum. She's the curator of the Greek coins at the Numismatic Museum of Athens. Well, they have a uh, uh, a lab with the XLF uh, uh, tools, and in the future we hope to to do it this, uh, this kind of analysis also. But it seems that there is not a very strong change in the alloy. Uh, what I can see is that um, they are more or less the same. Thank you. And Gilles, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, uh, Federico, so one, one question again about these um, uh, decrease in the weight standard. When, as we all know, when coins circulate because of coin wear, all the coins tend to lose weight as well. So if you keep minting new coins at the same standard, um, after a while, the new coins would have would be have, will be heavier than the ones who have been around for you know 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So it seems that it makes sense for the minting authority, unless you're able to recycle everything systematically, which is sort of, un, well, not realistic. It makes sense to lower weight standard, at least to adjust with the actual ways of circulating coin. So it may not necessarily mean that it's a specific crisis, but maybe just an adjustment to the circulating material. It's possible. It's just an adjustment, of course, and uh, it also depends on the organization of the mint. Uh, so how the um, the mint is organized and linked to the city, to the administrative structure. What I can say is that um, uh, what we have, the material that we have from auctions, from museum collection, uh, they mostly come from hoards. And you can imagine that these kind of hordes, uh, these kind of coins that we have with the higher weights uh, comes from horse, so they were not withdrawn after. So they are not uh, remelt to, to produce new coins. So that's why, because they were hidden before new weight standard, if there is a, a reduction uh, was, was applied. So maybe also could be the, um, the answer, I think. So they were not circulating anymore, so it was impossible to, to remelt. Do you have any other questions? Oh, maybe one more. Um, you're not seeing any coin uh, clipping, right? No, because uh, there is a problem about the selection of materials, because if we just have uh, coins that are um, from hordes, uh, it's very rare to have clipped coins uh, inside hordes. Uh, and also the market, uh, as many coins come from auctions, um, there is a selection of coins for, uh, uh, for, for, for market. I have to say that there is a recent paper of Cleanthi Sidiropoulos, for example, which is the curator of the Museum of Iraklio, who has found some past documents of the past decades uh, where there is the confiscation of coins to goldsmiths. And there, is, uh, there are some, um, uh, some papers showing that uh, broken coins were found at uh, goldsmiths' uh, labs where they were remelted. So I think that after the founding of these hordes, a part of them was discarded and uh, put out of the market just to be remelted for uh, other uses. And the other part, the most important was uh, to went to the market. So there is also a selection of coins. Uh, and this is a point that should be considered also when we analyze the weight standard, because we just have selected coins. Now, I was asking a question because in, in your charts, there were some very light coins. Um, yes, yes, it's true. It's true. Uh, there are not coins with holes or clipped coins, but there are very light coins. And that's why also there was an idea that there were another standard 
or about eight grams or another pro official production that was produced for other needs, like for example, to make some uh, exchange with Rhodes or Cyprus where they used a different standard, but I don't think this is the case. So just in the production, there are very uh, few coins, but they are dropping very down, it's true. Uh, 